Muslim scholar here. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay? So they, they, they have refused. So as this media exposure grows, you will see that we, we are not here to ask parliament to declare them non-Muslims. We are not here to, to, to incite any kind of... No, no. They are our brothers as citizens of this country, as human beings. But as far as the Islamic identity is concerned, no. You cannot malign Muslims like the, the pamphlet you just saw and then claim to speak on behalf of uh, Muslims. And this message is going out. In, in, the, in the United States, every channel, every TV outlet, every media outlet has refused to accept the Qadiani viewpoint as the Islamic viewpoint, except Fox. <laughs> okay? So you, you will see, you will see Naseem Mahdi and you will see the other guy, um, uh, Haris, on Fox TV. We view it, we analyze it, we report it, but you know why Fox wants it? Because Fox wants to create uh, uh, divisive issues. That's how they sell their ratings and everything. So you have to understand how the media works. The media wants a story. The media wants something to report on, something that is odd, something that is divisive, and, and so on. But again, do not shy away from it. Do not be afraid of the controversy. Um, uh, uh, the door of the, the, the Muslims is always open. They are welcome to come to our mosque. They are welcome to come to our imam. They are welcome to come and talk about issues. Uh, we do not wish them ill in any sense, way, or form. The only thing we say is do not represent Islam when you don't talk to the, the Muslims. And, and don't malign the Muslims. So, there was a report in BBC last uh, week saying that the bus campaign, the famous bus campaign, every, anybody here seen their bus campaign? Yes. Seen, okay, you've seen the bus campaigns, okay. The bus campaign is back. So what are they doing? They are trying in their own way. Maybe they are sincere. They really don't know <laughs> how, how English works. I, I won't say that they are, uh, they, they are that bad, that they're doing it deliberately. Maybe they, they don't know, okay. But saying, like Brother Imam Ghani said, saying, implying loyalty, freedom, equality, respect, and peace. Now, Brother Shahid will come and explain to you why they are a cult. Loyalty means loyalty to everybody except the Pakistani government. <laughs> loyalty to everybody except the Indonesian government, the laws that have been passed in those countries. Loyalty to every Western government, but loyalty to no Muslim government. Okay. <laughs> freedom. Freedom means that they cannot come to this place. They cannot go to a Muslim mosque. They cannot talk to what they call non ahmadi ghair ahmadi okay, person. They cannot do a bunch of things this they call freedom. They want to give us their freedom? Sorry. <laughs> okay? We, we don't want that kind of freedom. They cannot hold any view or they cannot read a book that is not published in their own uh, uh, environment. If you go and discuss it, you will be looked at like this. They will not answer your questions. I am a witness here. I took some books when I was 10, 15 years ago. We can't, uh, we, can't, we can't comment on that. Why are you reading those books? Why are you going to sit among those people? Change your company. You know? This is freedom? Sorry. We don't want it. Equality. Dear women, Qadiani women don't vote. They are not allowed to vote. They are not represented in their general body. Uh, ISNA, the Islamic Association of North America, their last president was a, a woman. Is that equality? Sorry, I don't want it. Okay? So th th this is the type of, this is the deception that we talk ab about. Respect. Respect for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. <laughs> Respect for Isa Alayhi No. Respect for Qaidi Azam? Respect for Alama Iqbal? No. Which respect are you talking about? Respect for Queen, Queen, Queen Victoria? Yeah. Okay, so the, the, the point is, you should be clear about what you're saying. Deception, people, people find out, the more noise you make, the more uh, noise other people make, and if, eventually the truth will come out, as it has come out in the US and Canada and parts of UK. And peace, well, I won't get into that, I will let you cover uh, peace there. <laughs> so what, what um, uh, no, a, a few words on peace. Eh? Peace, uh, peace again, jihad, we are not, we are against jihad, okay. Can the Pakistani government uh, have, an, uh, have an army? Yeah, 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 yeah. So when there was a, a battle in Kashmir, the Qadianis raised uh, uh, a militia called Furqan Force to go and fight on the Indian border. Yeah, that's okay. 
So what kind of jihad? Oh, the jihad where you go fight other people for the sake of your religion. No Muslim has done that. So you make a straw man and then you punch the straw man down and say, oh, we are peaceful. You see, this is the type of, 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 of a deception that we see here. So what should we do? Number one, don't worry. There isn't anything illegal about fighting for your identity as the number of Muslims becomes larger and larger in the United Kingdom. These issues will arise. They are bound to rise. Everybody expects it. The government ex ex expects it. And we should... Uh, and groups that don't fight for their rights or don't fight for their identity or don't fight for their position will lose. So fight, fight in the way that if an Ahmadi were to come here today, he would leave with noor in his heart. Fight in that way. Fight in a, a content and a way of expression that if an Ahmadi were to hear you saying something, he would leave with some thoughts in his mind. He, he would leave with the right attitude back. This is the way we should fight. But fighting for our rights is not a problem. The hearings in parliament, in media, we are doing so many good things for the community. Report them. Ask your mosque committee to report it to the Croatian Guardian. Ask it to report to the Wimbledon Guardian. Ask them to report. We Muslims engage in so many social things. We should, we should report them. I know we are very humble. We don't want to report everything, but we should. We should raise our profile in the community. Third thing, the members of parliament that were in that hearing that was based on that story, that was based on that thing, you know that story I told you a short while ago? Those parliamentarians are from your area. Go to them. Go to their surgery. Talk to them and say, this is sorry, but they don't represent me. That's all. This, that's all. I, I don't hate them. No Muslim in the UK hates them, but it's, it's a problem of identity. They're not Muslims. Why, why was all this brouhaha, all this story about a, 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 fake, a fake pamphlet, a fake, a fictitious thing that, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that occurred? Ask that question. So thank you for your time. Thank you for everything. Alhamdulillah, we're very happy to have this conference here again. And I've just recapped to you what happened in the last one year between last April and this April. Thank you. Jazakallah. Uh, Jazakallah khair. But, but that Brother Chaudhary Saab for his words, mashallah. It's very, very informative. People are taking notes. Everyone should be taking notes. So much information. Can we possibly say we can remember it all? Raise your hand if you, if you can remember everything, mashallah. Raise your hand if you can remember everything. You can remember everything? Mashallah. Your memory is better than mine, that means. Huh? Try to make Better. notes, jot some Better. notes down, and try to remember it all, as much as you can, inshallah. Uh, Jazakumullah khair. One more announcement, in front of you, you have leaflets. And these leaflets are of Message TV. Message TV is a new channel online, currently online, but, but wants to expand, inshallah. And, and they concentrate on on such issues, Qadianis, Shias, etc. And these are the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, those who, are, who have given their lives to uphold the Sunnah of the Prophet and the consensus of the Sahaba. So have a look at these leaflets and try to support their work. One pound a month, mashallah, can go a very long way in, in the work of Message TV in whatever they are doing to expand their works and their efforts. So, Allah, please do have a look at the leaflets yes. provided. I will now request Brother Abdul Rahman Sanji Qadr. to please, Abdul Qadr. Abdul Qadr, to please um, uh, present an sheet for us in the Urdu language. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ya de Mustafa Asi बस गई है सीने में याद मुस्तफा ऐसी बस गई है सीने में जिस्म हो कहीं अपना दिल तो है मदीने में यादें मुस्तफा ऐसी बस गई है सीने में मेरे आका मौला का घर तो है मदीने में मेरे आका मौला का घर तो है मदीने में 
हम अगर वो रहते हैं आशिकों के सीने में हम अगर वो रहते हैं आशिकों के सीने में याद मुस्तफ़ा ऐसी बस गई है सीने में कौन सी जमीन उनके आशिकों से खाली है कौन सी जमीन उनके आशिकों से खाली है हर जगह है परवाने शम्मा है मदीने में हर जगह है परवाने शम्मा है मदीने में याद मुस्तफ़ा ऐसी बस गई है सीने में चार सुधेरा था जुलमतों का ढेरा था चार सुधेरा था जुलमतों का ढेरा था आका तेरे आने से बजम जगमगाई है आका तेरे आने से बजम जगमगाई है याद मुस्तफ़ा ऐसी बस गई है सीने में जिंदगी हकीकत में बस उसी ने पाई है जिंदगी हकीकत में बस उसी ने पाई है मुस्तफ़ा के कूचे में जिसको मौत आई है मुस्तफ़ा के कूचे में जिसको मौत आई है याद मुस्तफ़ा ऐसी बस गई है सीने में जिसम हो कहीं अपना दिल तो है मदीने में याद मुस्तफ़ा ऐसी बस गई है सीने में अस्सलाम वालेकुम वरहि वबरक आई डिड ऑल माय एम प्राइंग इन द कार एम ऑलवेज फाइंड दीज ओसम एंड ओ इंस्पायरिंग ओकेजन्स बिकॉज I never expected to be speaking to other Muslims. We were taught as Gadianis to distrust Muslims and there was always an undercurrent of hatred. It was really rarely explicit, but it was always there. We always were made to fear Muslims. So if I'd been asked to give this talk say 10 years ago, I would have politely rejected declined the invitation. So jazakallah khair to the Croydon Masjid for inviting us all and for holding this event. I'm going to discuss inshallah today some of the uh, cult-like aspects and I touched on the first um and most important aspect of what it's like to be in a cult. You are taught to fear the other. You are taught to fear the outsider. But there are many other aspects as well. there is an external aspect the way the group presents itself to the outside world and there is the internal aspect the way the group relates to its own membership and to those who belong to it and then to those who go ahead and leave it now we've heard the term cult being used on several occasions and some uh, of my um colleagues in the ahmadiyya awareness have sometimes asked me do you not think this is quite a strong term to use well yeah it is a strong term i agree but is it accurate i think if you look at all of the criteria of a cult the way that uh, a group behaves the way it um creates a uh, a cult personality uh, or a personality of a cult if you will the way it um for example rejects any kind of dissent from within and the way it coerces its membership 
to behave in a certain way, to act in a certain way. All of these, you could say, are cult-like aspects. But there is also a very strong desire to present itself externally in a very, very positive way. If you take, for example, um, the Scientology group. Has anyone heard of Scientology? Yeah, hands up if you heard of Scientology. So a few of you. Scientology is, is a group. It's called the Church of Scientology. It has nothing to do with churches and nothing to do with science. But there you go, that's another group that has a, a deceptive name. The, the Scientologists are actually more worthy of respect than the Ahmadiyya in one important way. They're not actually trying to deceive people into thinking that they're another religion that they're not. So I'm going to start with discussing how the Ahmadiyya presents itself to the outside world. And a lot of the things that... Uh, I'm going to cover, I'll have to skim over quickly because my, my time has been reduced, but Alhamdulillah, Brother Akbar was also able to cover much of the stuff I was going to cover, which is very useful indeed. So we'll, we'll start with the, the royal wedding yesterday. This is a classic example of how um, the, the cult really wanted to be accepted very strongly into British society, and in a way it over-projected itself. Yeah? So what it did was it released a, a press release, as you know, uh, in which it said it was going to have a party in honor of the royal couple. Now, up and down the country, there are all kinds of viewpoints that have been accommodated. Some people are respectful of the royals, some people aren't. That's what it's like to live in a democracy. You're allowed to have some kind of disagreement about what you think of the monarchy. But what you shouldn't do is have a party which is paid for by the membership, where only certain key people are invited. That was a very cult-like thing to do. And uh, in, in doing so, they didn't actually achieve anything at all, except spend the forced contributions of their membership. The other thing that they do quite a lot is in the speeches of Mirza Masroor. Has anyone heard of Mirza Masroor Ahmad? Mirza Masroor Ahmad is a current leader of the Ahmadiyya movement. He's the spiritual head, not quite the CEO, if you like, more like the chairman. The CEO is a gentleman by the name of Rafi Kayat, who is a businessman. But the spiritual leader of Ahmadiyya is called Mus uh, Mirza Masroor Ahmad. And very often in his speeches, and much more overtly in the speeches of the previous leader, there are always these references to opponents. You know, it's, it's very much about who the opposition are. And clearly the, the coded references are to us, to Muslims. So the, the Ahmadiyya, the ordinary Ahmadi people, are taught to think of us as their opposition. Alhamdulillah, this isn't working anymore. A lot of the youngsters are not buying into this. A lot of the Ahmadi youngsters are not buying into this because they're intermixing more and more in the schools and in the universities. They're ignoring the orders of their elders. They realize that what they're being taught is hogwash. And they're beginning to... The, the mixing with the Muslims is making them realize that actually we're not as bad as they were made to believe, which, alhamdulillah, is a very, very positive move. So this lack of engagement with Muslims is, is um, a, a very a prominent feature of Ahmadiyya. They discourage it. For example, uh, Brother Akbar was talking about this event where only the Ahmadiyya were allowed to attend this interfaith event. If you ever hear of an interfaith event, Nearly always, it'll be in, in this country anyway, the, if the Ahmadiyya are organizing it, there will be no Muslim representation at all. Now, it's up to us, of course, as Muslims to have multi-faith events, and I'm sure that these do happen up and down the country. But you will note that in any Ahmadiyya organized interfaith event, no Muslim will be represented. They demand to be the exclusive voice of the Muslims. So that, again, is a way of controlling the speech of their membership. So that is another cult-like aspect. Um, Brother Akbar gave a very detailed account of the so-called Ahmadiyya uh, hate campaign that's been going on the last year or so, where they were accusing a certain number of people, um, it, my, myself and Brother Akbar included, of indulging in hate towards Ahmadiyya. This is an absolute lie, clear-cut lie. The leaflet that Brother Akbar referred to never existed. We've both seen the report. It does not exist. Never been produced. But here's the other thing. Me and Brother Akbar still have family in the Ahmadiyya. Do you honestly think we would want any harm to come to them? They're our family. Rasulullah also had family who were non-Muslims. Do you think he wanted any harm to come to them, or do you think he gave dawah? We think the same way. We want to invite our uh, Ahmadi family members to Islam. And I would ask for all of you to pray for us that those remaining few family members who are still in Ahmadiyya come to Islam. Inshallah. There's good news on that front, by the way. Um, Alhamdulillah, my, my children have uh, come to Islam, which is wonderful news. They are now living with me, that's wonderful news. My sister has come to Islam, Alhamdulillah. I'm, I'm working on my mum, but you know, Hidayah is from Allah alone. But please continue to pray for all of the Ahmadis who've come over to Islam, who've left that darkness behind, um, so that their families can join us. Um, 
Another aspect of the Ahmadiyya, the way that Ahmadiyya relates to the outside world, they present their beliefs in a very vague way. So, for example, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, the founder of Ahmadiyya, is cast as some kind of reformer, uh, sometimes a messiah, but never directly a prophet. You never hear it said that we believe Mirza Ghulam Ahmad to be a prophet. You don't hear that, but it is on their website, it is in the writings. So. The, the fact that they misrepresent their beliefs or that they're deliberately vague about their beliefs is not an accident. It's done so as to kind of keep the provocation to a level that's sustainable. I think they recognize that if they were to raise this, not only would they face more difficulty in terms of engagement with the Muslims or to be recognized as Muslims, but even um, the non-Muslims to whom they try and spread their message, like the, for example, the, the Christians and the Jews, would not accept and they would become very suspicious of, of that kind of uh, presentation. And the final uh, outside aspect that I'd like to touch upon is the numbers. Does anyone know, and you're not allowed to answer here, brother, but does anyone here know how many Muslims there are in Croydon? I'll, I'll tell you. Sorry, go on. 30, very close. It's 20,000. There are about 20,000. Is that roughly right? 20, 25,000 20, 25, Muslims in Croydon. Mashallah. Anyone know how many Ahmadis there are in the UK? 18,000. No, it's actually 19,500. And I know because I have the official inside figures, because they were leaked to me along with a whole bunch of other information, which, which shows that, for example, um, the Ahmadi are around 5,000, 6,000 in the US. They, they, they actually claim on their website to have, um, at various points, 200 million members, 70 million members. Yeah, 200 million, they outnumber the Shia, but they're never heard of in the news, so why is that? Um, the, the reporters, the press, um, pick up press releases. You know, the press, the, the press are very lazy, right? They, they're either very lazy or they're very overworked, or a bit of both. They get a press release and they just reproduce it. So they very, very easily reproduce the numbers of the Ahmadiyya. But as Muslims, it's our job to challenge. When we see something that is clearly false, now that you have the information, now that you know from the Ahmadiyya's own figures that there are only 19,500 Ahmadis in the UK, the next time you hear this figure of 50,000, 60,000, 100, whatever, however many people they claim to have in the UK, write into the newspaper and let them know this is false. We actually know that they're true numbers. And 19,500. Therefore, you are over-representing them in your newspaper and perhaps you might want to feature um, a balancing piece representing a much larger representation of Islam. For example, the, the Muslim community in Croydon. There are 20,000 of us. Come and visit us, have a chat with us, find out what we're doing, how we're benefiting the society around us, as I'm sure 20,000 Muslims in Croydon really are. So that's the other aspect, the hugely exaggerated numbers. Only a cult would do this. There's no reason to exaggerate your numbers. I mean, Muslims, Muslims don't need to go around bandying about big numbers. You know, we already have, alhamdulillah, very, very big numbers. It, the last reports are 2.4 million in the UK, about 1.6 billion in the world. Okay, so the second part of my talk, which I'll try and keep as short as I can, is the internal aspect of uh, the cult-like machinery of Ahmadiyya. What is the focus of Ahmadiyya to a typical Ahmadi? I'll tell you what it is. It's money, 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 money. This is a letter from the Ahmadiyya to an insider who is kind enough to share it with me, uh, where they are asking for a complete breakdown of your finances. Now, a gentleman in the light blue shirt, would you mind telling me how much you earn? Would you mind telling me every single penny that you make? You would mind, wouldn't you? Of course you'd mind. But here is a form that is sent to every Ahmadi member, which is effectively a means test. Why is it a means test? Do you know what a means test is? Hands up who knows what a means test is. Anyone? Okay, tell us what a means test is. Exactly. It's usually done for benefits, for the purpose of benefits. And it's a way for, usually for the government to find out whether you qualify for some kind of benefit. It's very invasive. They ask very detailed, very personal questions. Now, this form is sent to every Ahmadi, and you are required to fill this in, and you're required as an obligation, as being a member of the Ahmadiyya, to pay 6.25% of your income every single year. It's an obligation, 6.25. Complete innovation. There's no Islamic basis for this, but if you don't do this, you are chucked out of Ahmadiyya. And according to them, that effectively chucks you out of Islam, as you can imagine. Nobody escapes this. 
Income includes salaries and wages, pension from former employers, state pension, child benefit, social security benefits, including unemployment benefit, income support, family credit, etc. Now, the interesting thing is that if you're poor, you end up actually paying 10% of your income. So it's the opposite of a normal tax system. 6.25% for an ordinary member, but it ends up being something like 10% if you're a poor member. This is extremely hard to live with, extremely hard. So money is an absolute focus. Here is another letter that I've got uh, sent to uh, a member where they're asking for a new uh, chanda to contribute to pay back a loan for Mirza Masroor of 160,000. Um, and giving them all kinds of moral blackmail, quoting Hadith out of context, says here, Oh, you who believe, fulfill your promises. Yes, of course. Anyone know about the 5 for 50 promise? I'll tell you about the 5 for 50 promise. Mirza Qulam Ahmad promised that he would write 50 volumes of a book called Brahini Ahmadiyya. He wrote four volumes, then he took a break of about 20 odd years, then he finally delivered the fifth volume. And in that time, lots of the people who'd paid him up front for these 50 volumes had died. Others, quite rightly, asked for their money back. He said, he was really disgusted with these people, and he said, yeah, sure, you can have your money back. And the words he used were really quite disgusting. But the point is, he said that his obligation was filled because the difference between five and 50 is one nukhta. Do you know what a nukhta is? Yeah? Right. So he said, my obligation is fulfilled. Yeah? Um, so anyway, so that's, that's the, the, the money aspect for you. So they talk about obligations, but this, this kind of language that they use is never consistent. You know, of course, in the Quran that Allah says quite clearly that if, there, if this had come from any other than him, that you would find many contradictions therein. If you look at the writings of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, if you look at the behavior of the cult machinery of the Ahmadiyya, you will find contradiction after contradiction after contradiction. I'll, I'll give you one piece of um, my, my philosophy that really made me realize with 100% conviction that there was a God. And that was when I was studying Mirza and I was thinking about leaving, I saw that if he had flipped a coin to get his prophecies, he would have had more luck. But the fact, no, I kid you not, I'm, I'm not making this up. His prophecies failed so often that it could not have been chance. There had to be a supernatural agent making a mockery of this man again and again and again at every turn every time he claimed prophecy every time he claimed to be a prophet every time he claimed that a certain opponent was going to die yes he used to make death prophecies all the time he would be made to look like he was humiliated and that was what really filled me with fear and made me realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actively making this man look like a liar there's no other way because if he flipped, flipped a coin he would have had more luck so the other aspect of the inside uh, machinery that makes it a cult is that there is an absolute monarchy in place. And that is, the word of their so-called Khalifa is absolute. Okay? You do what he says, that's that. Nobody is allowed to have a difference of opinion. In, in this mosque, I'm sure there will be... And hands up, actually, probably no one wants to put up their hands if they vote Tory. Anyone vote Tory here? Anyone? You won't admit to it, but maybe there's one Tory voter in here or a few. There'll be maybe a Labour voter. Any Labour voters in here? Any Lib Dem voters? Okay, so a few labels. I mean, the, the point is we are allowed a difference in opinion. And although I used a poor example in terms of political parties, you are not allowed a difference of, of real opinion, of religious opinion, if you're in the Ahmadiyya. There is one official Facebook page. You're not allowed to have your own Facebook pages as an Ahmadi. Um, you're not, they were told recently not to engage on the internet. Only an official group is allowed to engage on the internet. And this is to control um, the, con the conversations, to control the discourse. And this, this kind of communication is very, very tightly controlled because they don't want their members to find the beauty of Islam. They don't want to realize, they don't want their membership to realize that Muslims are actually decent people. So um, the final bit of uh, inside uh, information that I have that um, you might have heard of, you might not have, is they, there is a lot of hypocrisy about the, the gender mixing. So for the leaders when they have um, events where they um, invite Westerners and so forth, there is free gender mixing. When Mirza Masrur wants to go over to uh, the woman's side in a wedding, there is, you know, he's allowed to mix. But if there is a wedding of followers of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad and there is any gender mixing of any kind or anything untoward that the, 
the center considers untoward, they will be expelled. And there was a recent case where a whole group of people was summarily expelled from Ahmadiyya. This is done very publicly in a very humiliating way. And this, this public humiliation is also a way of keeping people in line. Because if they're scared that they're going to get kicked out and they're going to lose their social connections, of course, they're not going to want to do anything that goes against the leadership. That makes it easier to control them. So, two very quick things before I finish. Muslims like um, Abdurrahman Bawasab and many others, myself and Brother Akbar included, were accused of hatred. The, the most ridiculous accusation that you could imagine, given that I have many family members who are still Ahmadi, and who I love to bits, incidentally. Yeah, two, two bits left, yeah? Okay, so my, my time's up, but uh, two quick things. I want to quote to you something. Um, do, you, do you, first of all, Please um, don't get too offended at this. Do you, by any chance, consider yourself Satan worshippers? No. no, of course not. Who do we worship? Right. But do you know who Mirza Masrur thinks we worship? Mirza Masrur, in a sermon, in a Friday sermon, January the 19th, 2007, said, Rejection of the Imam of the Age in itself takes one to the Satanic Abyss, the Imam of the Age being Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. And who is taken in by satanic temptation cannot have any connection with the gracious God. To follow the Satan is in effect to worship him. So what he is saying is that anyone who rejects Mirza Ghulam Ahmad worships Satan. So I want to finish now and I want to say how can, how can we make a difference? Ahmadis are leaving Ahmadiyya. They are coming back to Islam. There are, it, this is happening day by day. We have emails and letters day by day where people are coming back. This is the real work. This is the real work that is going. People are coming back to Islam. The community does seem to be caving in in terms of its youngsters. So you can work by, don't separate yourself from Ahmadi. If you find out someone is an Ahmadi, right, get loads of your friends together, sit down and discuss things with them. Make sure that you have someone who really knows their Islam to hand though, because they're very, very good at twisting and turning Islam to suit themselves. But communicate with them, invite them to Islam. This is the main thing. This is our opportunity. They are coming back to Islam. They are beginning to realize it's a cult. Just today, I got an email from, um, this came to the, to the website, to the management, from three um, young ladies from Morden who are sick and fed up of the Ahmadiyya leadership and want to come back to Islam but don't know how. Well, we've got to show them how. We've got to show them they would be welcome in our communities if they come back to Islam. 19,500 people, everybody. It's our job to bring them back. And inshallah, I'm absolutely convinced that in my lifetime, that can happen. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah al-wahid al-ahad. الواهب الوالي الصمد نحمده على أن خلق الخلق ودبره من غير معين ومدد ونشكره على أن جعلنا من أشرف مخلوقاته وأفاض علينا النعم لا تحصى ولا تعد ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله المبعوث إلى الأحمر والأبيض والأسود صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين إلى الأبد. My respected ulama, my brothers, my elders, my mothers and my sisters. Just as how you and I were gathered in this gathering, or are gathered in this gathering, Allah Jalla Jalaluhu wa Amma Nawaluhu also gathered us in the Alimul Arwah. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala took a covenant from you and I. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu wa Amma Nawaluhu questioned us and he posed the question Alastu bi rabbikum am I not your Lord unanimously in one voice at one time without any hesitation we said oh Allah of course you are our Lord Bala 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we acknowledged as our Lord. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala had a second majlis, a second gathering, wherein the souls of the Anbiya alayhimu salatu wa salam, they were also gathered. One majlis was Aam, a general gathering. And then there was a khas gathering, a special gathering. Wherein Allah wa ta'ala then made a covenant with the Anbiya alayhimu salam. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِيثَاقَ النَّبِيِّينَ لَمَا آتَيْتُكُمْ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ ثُمَّ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَكُمْ لَتُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ وَلَا تَنْصُرُنَّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Anbiya alayhim as-salam He took a covenant from the Anbiya alayhim as-salam I will give you kitab I will give you a book, I will give you wisdom. <coughs> Anbiya alayhim salam came into this world from Adam alayhi salam until the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed all of the Anbiya alayhim salam the following. I will give you a kitab. I will give you wisdom. ثُمَّ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَكُمْ If by chance there was a Nabi to come or there is a Nabi to come in your zamana and in your respective time, in your respective eras and he also testifies and also affirms that which you have at that point in time, you have to forget about what Allah has given you. You have to assist His cause. You have to assist His cause. The Mufassireen alayhim rahmah the masters of exegesis, they explain to us, this Rasul, this Prophet, this Messenger, there was no none other then Janabi Nabi Kareem Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah informed the Anbiya alayhi salam, if you have your respective shari'as, if you have your respective kitabs, you have wisdom. But such a Nabi to come, such a Nabi to come and he affirms that what is with you. At that point you must leave your thing and you have to assist his cause. لَتُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ وَلَتَنْصُرُنَّ you have to bring Iman on him as well and assist his cause. Sheikh Suleiman Ghani, Jazak, Allah give him Jazai Khair, and the other ulama that have pointed out the incident of Mi'raj, it's a very lengthy issue. But taking one issue from that, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taken on the 27th of Rajab to Masjid al-Aqsa, where he led the Salah and was the Imam of 124,000 Anbiya They all testified to the finality and they bore Iman that Rasulullah is the last Nabi. Every Nabi that came done the same thing. Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, all of the Anbiya alayhi salam. Part of this ayah or part of the covenant has been fulfilled. Assisting the cause of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the job of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam. Where he will come down before the end of Qiyamah. And he will fight the Dajjal. He will slay the Dajjal. He will join the forces of Mahdi will join with Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam. They will be defeated. The force of the Jal will be defeated. Then Allah wa ta'ala will appoint a time for Isa alayhi salam where he will remain in this dunya. He will get married. He will have children. And then he will be buried right next to Janabi Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions the coming of Isa alayhi salam which has reached the stage known as Tawatur, known by the ulama. In simple words, we can explain it like this. It is such a unanimous belief amongst the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. If a person has doubt and negates such a belief, unanimously that person does not have the Iman within his heart. Isa alayhi salam is alive according to the Aqeedah and the belief of the Muslims, the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. He will come down prior to Qiyamah and he will then fight the forces of Dajjal. They will be victorious and then he will remain on the dunya for a period of time. And then afterwards he will be buried next to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions a hadith. Let's not get fooled by this, that perhaps Isa alayhi salam will come and perhaps that means that the, the Nabut of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is actually not nullified because another Nabi will come after him. Let's take this out of our mind. What did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say in a hadith? He mentions, I have been given fadila, I have been given virtue over the other Anbiya alayhi salam in regards to six things. Fadiltu ala al-anbiya ibisit. أُعْتِيتُ جَوَامِعِ الْكَلِمِ وَنَصِرْتُ بِالرُّعْبِ وَأُحِلَّتْ لِي الْغَنَائِمِ وَجُعِلَتْ لِي الْأَرْمِ مَسْجِدًا وَطَهُورًا وَأُرْسِلْتُ إِلَى النَّاسِ كَافَ وَخُطِمَ بِي النَّبِيُّنْ Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the following I have been given fazilat and status over the other anbiya alayhi salam in regards to six things I say small words but yet they are vast in meaning جَوَامِعِ الْكَلِمِ Small words but vast in meaning. As they say very nicely in the Urdu language, they say, It's like encompassing the oceans of the world and trying to fit it into a small jug. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was bestowed with ra'ab, awe. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was bestowed with such a ni'mah that the mali ghanimat, the booty from the spoilers of war are permissible. Not for any previous ummah, and not only Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The fourth thing, he mentions that the, masj the place of earth has been made in its entirety a place as sujood. A Muslim has no excuse that I cannot perform my salah. And then he mentions, wa ursiltu ila nasi kafa. I have been sent as a Nabi to every single living human being that will come until the day of Qiyamah. And wa khutima bi an nabiyun Prophecy and prophethood and risala has terminated on the coming of Janabi Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Finished. I quote one more incident and then I finish. Hazrat Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu ta'ala an. He was a Jewish rabbi. And he was in Medina al Munawra and he was waiting the coming of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A great moment when Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they are making their way. It's a very famous incident. And many of the time perhaps we've heard this. They are anticipating, waiting Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to come. Everyone is waiting in anticipation. Rasulullah 